In this lecture, we're going to start the troubleshooting domain. So on the part two test, troubleshooting is a large portion of the exam. Uh, we're going to take all that stuff that we learned in part one and, it's, and take that hardware and networking, and now we're going to see what do we do when things go wrong. So the first thing we have to do is we've got to talk about our troubleshooting process. And as a CompTIA a technician, they have a six-step troubleshooting process that we should use. And it's really important to understand their process because that's the way the exam is written towards. Um, even if you've been a technician before, you may have had experience in doing it your own way. For the exam, you always have to understand the six-step troubleshooting process. The nice thing about this process is it's pretty uh, relatively straightforward. Um, and the nice thing is that if you start on a project and you have to turn it over to another technician, you're all using the same process. So the first step is we're going to identify the problem. Next, we're going to establish our theory of probable cause, basically question the obvious. Uh, we're going to test our theory to determine if that was the cause. We'll establish a plan of action and resolve the problem and implement a solution. We'll verify all system functionality and, if applicable, implement any preventive measures. And then we're going to document our findings, actions, and outcomes. So we're going to talk about each of these a little bit more in depth as we go through here. The first one, identifying the problem. The first thing when you get to a user, you have to ask them, what is the problem, right? Get, ask questions. Figure out what were the changes that they made right before the problem existed, or if they made a change before the problem existed. Uh, perform a backup before you make any changes to make sure you don't lose the user's data. Um, you basically want to start getting the groundwork of what do you think the problem is. So, for example, if somebody says the internet doesn't work, that doesn't really tell you much, right? Instead, you need to start asking a customer, well, what isn't working for you? Is it a particular website like Facebook that's not loading? Or is it you can't get to any website? Um, and then you can start further diagnosing the problem to start figuring out what is that cause. Second, you're going to have to establish a theory of probable cause. And what this means is you're just going to start looking for things that might be obvious. For instance, I've had a customer who called me and says, I can't get the computer to turn on. I go and I look, and it was unplugged from the wall. That was an obvious issue, right? You plug it back in the wall, hit the on button, the thing works. Um, so question those obvious things. A lot of times you'll see that. Or if you're working on a wired network and the Ethernet cable is not plugged in, then they're not going to have network connectivity, right? Um, I've had issues where customers say, hey, uh, I can't get on the internet, and I go out there and I look, and their cord goes across the room because they moved their desk away from the wall outlet. And they've run it over with their chair so many times that it's all frayed, and all of those eight wires are exposed, and some of them have been cut. And if they're cut, you're not going to have the transmit and receive working. So look for signs of damage for the hardware. Ensure your cables are plugged in. Make sure that you have power to the workstation. Test your theory to determine the cause. You need to put that theory to the test. So in the case of you know, somebody saying, my internet doesn't work, uh, you need to start looking for information to confirm or deny your theory. Maybe your theory is, hey, this network cable isn't plugged in. You go check, and it is plugged in. Now you need to come up with a different theory. Um, in this case, if we're going to test the theory, for instance, I can't get to Facebook, I go and I look at the person's IP address, and I see a 169.254.something.something address. What kind of address is that? It's an automatic private IP address, IPPA. Those addresses can't get on the internet. That's what happens when DHCP fails. Okay? So in this case, DHCP wasn't able to get an address, so we picked up an IPPA address, which means you're not going to get on the internet. And so now that we know that, we'll go ahead and try solving that problem. So test your theory to determine the cause. The fourth step, we're going to establish a plan of action to resolve the problem. So now we've established, in this case, the internet wasn't working, we found out the cables were good, but it has an IPPA address, how do we resolve that problem? What steps do I need to take? Uh, do we need to buy a new uh, cable? Do I need to buy a new software? What is the, what's going to be the fix? And as we establish that plan, then we're going to go into step five where we're going to start implementing that plan. So in step five, we, or step four, we, you know, we, we're, or five, we're going to implement those, uh, the fixes. And then once we've verified, we have to verify that problem has been fixed. So in our case, if the internet wasn't working, we had an IPPA address, we might do something like ipconfig slash release, where we drop that IP address, and then ipconfig slash renew, where we get a new IP address. Now we can verify, can I get online? Can I now get to Facebook? Um, is everything still working? Sometimes you'll go and fix something like uh, they'll have, there's a problem with a certain file, and you'll do a restore of a file. Well, maybe when you restored a particular folder that had the file in it, you might have overwritten some other files they needed that have changed since the last backup. So make sure with the customer that everything is working properly before you leave. Otherwise, you're just going to get another call five minutes later. And the other thing is you want to implement preventive measures. So let's say you came out there because you had a, uh, the customer had gotten a virus in their computer. 
Maybe you want to give them some training on how to avoid getting viruses in the future, right? Or maybe you need to update their antivirus so it doesn't happen again. If they didn't have a good backup, maybe you're going to set it up so they're having a good backup system. Put those things in place to help prevent issues in the future. And then six, the last step, and uh, probably one of the most important steps, even though most people tend to skip this step, is to document your findings and actions and outcomes. So when you're done, you're going to go ahead and say, what was wrong with the computer? How did you fix it? And any lessons learned that that user or other technicians can have. The reason why I say this is most important is because a lot of times, especially in a corporate environment, you may see the same issues over and over and over again. Okay? Um, if we see that Sarah's computer went offline and isn't getting a good IP address, and then Joe's computer went offline and didn't get a good IP address, it may be systemic of a larger problem. It's not just a Sarah problem, and it may not just be a Joe problem. It may be an issue with our switch starting to fail. It may be an issue with our cabling starting to go bad. Um, I had an issue where I work. We got a call that one computer dropped offline. We went and we looked and we go, oh, this is weird. And we found out that the, the cable that went from the computer to the wall uh, was bad. So we replaced it. Next day we get a call from another user in the same office. Their computer couldn't get, off, couldn't get online. We sent a technician out. Their cables were fine. They couldn't figure out the problem. They started tracing it from the wall jack back to the switch. And they found that there was a break in the cable up in the attic. Uh, next day we get another call. Two more computers dropped offline. The next day, three more dropped offline. What we ended up finding out the problem was we were using fiber optic cables in the walls and they had gotten a rat infestation. And the rats like to go and chew through the cables and take the cladding, the fiber uh, around the fiber that protects it, and make nests out of it in the wintertime. So they started chewing through $10,000 worth of fiber cables so that they could make nests. And so the problem wasn't a computer problem, it was an extermination problem. And so we had to call the exterminator, get the rats out, and then rewire the building. Okay? So just because one user went offline, we started seeing after two or three days as these users started following like dominoes what the bigger problem was. And we never would have figured that out had we not had technicians talking and documenting their findings of what the issues were between users. So some common points of failure that you're going to see when you're troubleshooting. Um, if you have a computer that's overheating because your cooling fans aren't working well enough, this is going to overheat and cause damage to your components. Components can start failing. If you have a processor that should last three or five years and it starts dying after 12 months, maybe it's overheating, right? Um, add-on cards. If you have an add-on card, like a network card, and it's not working properly, maybe it's loose. Make sure it's fully inserted into the socket. If it's a card that requires additional power, like a, like a graphics card that needs an extra six-pin PCIe uh, connector, make sure you have the extra power on it. Um, the card may even have a short. Maybe it got ESD when you went to install it because you didn't use your wrist strap. These are things you got to think about. Uh, your CPU. It could be loose or defective. If it's loose, it's not properly in the socket. There's, there's 200 pins there, and if they all don't make contact, uh, those 200 plus pins, you're going to have problems. Uh, motherboard components. There's capacitors and regulators on the motherboards that can actually lock up or fail. That can cause issues for you. If you diagnose it down to that level, what you're going to end up having to do is just replace the motherboard, because we don't replace single resistors on a motherboard, generally. Um, memory modules. You might find out that the RAM is bad, right? Maybe you go to look at the computer and it's supposed to have 8 gigs of memory and you see two 4 gigabyte sticks but only 4 gigs is showing up in, in the BIOS. Maybe it's the fact that somebody didn't push it all the way in, right? It didn't get fully inserted. Or the stick itself is bad. Drives. You may have loose cables or not enough power on your hard drives. Or the drive is so old it's been dropped too many times and now it's malfunctioning mechanically. Uh, front panel uh, cables and connectors. So if you don't have the LEDs blinking like they're supposed to, you don't have the speaker uh, list, uh, making noise like it's supposed to, you try pressing the power button and the computer doesn't turn on, maybe those front panel indications aren't tied to the motherboard because somebody un uh, loosened those. CMOS battery. You start losing time and BIOS settings. That's going to be an indication that battery is going bad. The BIOS chip itself. It can be esd or have lightning issues. And that can destroy the BIOS chips, causing catastrophic failure of the system because without the BIOS, the computer doesn't even know how to take input from the mouse and keyboard or your output to the screen. So you got to make sure those things are working. These are just some common areas as you're looking at a computer from a hardware perspective, where are these common issues at? From a laptop perspective, it's all the same that we just talked about, but in addition to that, we also have those PC cards and Express cards. If you don't fully insert them, they won't make a good connection, it won't work. Okay. Um, if you eject a card before it is technically stopped, they're not hot swappable. They're hot swappable, you have to tell them to eject first. Uh, if, you, if you just physically pull it out, you can cause an error on the computer. Uh, dongles. So some PC cards, because they're only you know, a very short distance tall, um, they don't fit things like an Ethernet jack. So what they'll use is they'll use a dongle, which plugs into the side and then gives you the big port. 
you look at my laptop, for instance, my VGA cable won't fit in the side of my laptop. So I have a dongle that connects from VGA to mini display port. That's what a dongle is. Converts from one cable to another, giving you that. And if that dongle is broken, it's not going to give you video output, right? Uh, hot swappable drives aren't inserted properly. As we saw with our Dell laptops here, we can take out the DVD drive and put in a floppy disk, right? Uh, and if we switch that drive and we don't push it all the way in, it doesn't make a good connection, it's not going to work properly. Um, if your LCD starts failing, the panel can fail or it can have frayed cables connecting that monitor. That would be a case where we need to go and replace it. And remember the rule of thumb we have for LCDs? If it's going to cost you twice the cost of the LCD to replace, just go ahead and get a new laptop. So if the laptop's worth $300 and the LCD costs $150, just buy a new laptop, right? Uh, if the LCD is going to be $50 and the laptop's $300, we'll fix the LCD, right? You just got to do a, do a judgment call on that. So here's a uh, sample question for you. Using the six-step trouble, six troubleshooting process that we talked about, what step do you verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures? Which step is that? Step five, exactly. So you'll get questions like that. You may get a question that says, put these steps in order, and you'll have to put one through six in order. Um, you may get, this is this step. What comes after verify full system functionality and, if applicable, implement preventive measures? And then you'd say, oh, that's documenting my outcomes, right? And that would be step six, right? So what comes next? What comes before? So have a good idea of what those orders are.